Good afternoon. Grab your lunch and join us for our part three of our four-part series on Asking Made Easier. I can't believe we're already at part three. Uh, today's topic, the relationship dance building rapport. Dr. Uh, Lori K. Davis, forgot that part, Executive Director of the Commonwealth Institute, South Florida. We are a network of successful business and professional women, and we provide leadership development, high-level networking, and mentoring through our content-rich programs and events. We're so pleased to bring this webinar series to you in partnership with National Leadership Institute and Joanne Brandy and Company. So just a quick story before we get started on how this webinar series came to be. Uh, I, as executive director, had a meeting with one of our major donors. And at the end of our meeting, and we, we have these meetings to discuss the year's funding. And at the end of this meeting, she said to me, you know, Lori, you, you, I would have I would have given you more. You left some money on the table. And I said, okay, well, can you give me, uh, can you give me, all right. And I gave her a number. Can you do more? And she said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you that number as long as you create, you create a webinar series, you create a webinar training on ASK. So here we are all together and here I am learning as well. So welcome. Everybody, you know, I'm anxious to jump in because I, I admitted to them beforehand. I have my Starbucks right here and I'm dying to drink it, but I didn't want to be mid sip as, as you needed me to talk. So, um, good afternoon, happy lunch hour, everybody. Happy Friday. So, Lori and Katie, we just want to thank you and the Commonwealth Institute for this wonderful partnership. This is part three of our series, Making the Ask. Um, so, real quickly about us we are National Leadership Institute and we happen to be a partner of the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy. Um, we work in partnership with them and with great folks like TCI to deliver contemporary fundraising training. So I'll stop right there for a minute. I wanna introduce Diana. Diana, are you out there? Cause she's gonna monitor some stuff for us. Diana, say hello if you're there. And if not, I'll keep going. There you are. <laughs> Hi everybody. First off her honeymoon guys. She's just back from her honeymoon. <laughs> Yes, and I'm so happy to be back. Thank you all for joining us. Whenever you get a chance throughout the presentation, make sure you're participating, posting your questions in our chat box, and as we go through our Q&A at the end, we'll make sure to answer as many as we can. But we are also recording this, so we'll make sure to share it with you all afterwards. So it's great to be here. Very good, and we do, we will have time for your questions, absolutely, so thank you, Diana. Um, so just real briefly, Joanna, let's look at that cause selling cycle, if we can, that next slide, because the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy calls fundraising cause selling. And your product is really the cause that you care so passionately about. And the sell, the ask, is really, it's just about making a smart connection with the right donor. So we know that approaching donors can be the same process that businesses use to approach their customers or their clients, right? So cause selling is a cycle of proven business strategies that work to help you sell a product or a service or your cause. So whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit, it all ends with making the ask of some type, which is daunting, but that's why we're here. So we brought in Joanna Brandy again for part three. She's one of our favorite instructors. Miss Joanna Brandy is a positive leadership consultant and coach. She's an author and a national speaker, does some amazing presentations around the country, and she has worked with for-profits and non-profits to help them build better relationships with their clients. So Joanna, take it away, we're ready. Okay, cool. This is so much fun to do. So I'm gonna go back, take a step back, for those of you who haven't been with us for the whole series, and I'm gonna give you a real brief overview of how we've come up to part three. We started by talking about relationships. And as we know, especially if we've been in business for a while, relationships are everything and everything is relationships, as Buckminster Fuller said wisely once. And the cause selling relationship model is important to understand as well. I love the cycle, but take a quick look at this. Everything has changed. When Raylene was introducing us here, she talked about contemporary selling strategies. There was an old way of selling. There was an old way of fundraising. And the old fundraising model and selling model was to spend 40% of your time 
closing and closing hard. That's why many people didn't like salespeople because it was always about the hard close. Well, thank goodness we have discovered that's a very inefficient, ineffective, and not very polite way to, to do it. So we've discovered, and through some research at the University of Arizona, and working with businesses, that what's happened over time, as we've really begun to understand that it's all about relationships, is that model has flipped upside down. And we only need to spend 10% of our time making the ask, making the sale, closing the deal, which I actually like to call opening the relationship. You're not closing anything. You are opening up a world of possibilities for, for the future. So that's the model we've been using here, spending 40% of your time upfront, building, building trust, building rapport, asking questions, listening carefully, and letting people know what the benefits of doing business with you are. So in our previous webinars, we've talked a little bit about this acronym that I created after 20 some odd years of working with CEOs and asking them the question, what makes people loyal? And I wrote on flip charts and wrote all these things down and then I would always save those flip chart papers and I began to see a pattern emerge. These are the things that are the most important in building lifetime loyal relationship with customers and donors. Trust, respect, appreciation, communication, and I might add communication without blame or judgment, and kindness. And just recently I was in Mobile, Alabama, working with a group of CEOs when one of them said to me, young lady, which made me feel really good. Young lady, there's a letter missing. I said, what letter is that? He said, S. If you don't do all of that with sincerity, it doesn't work. So I added the S onto my acronym. Business is all about relationships. If you think about it, your business, no matter what it is, sits on a three-legged configuration like a tripod a tripod of relationships. Each leg of the tripod represents a different set of relationships. There are the external relationships, and those are the relationships you have with anyone that's outside the company. The external relationships are the ones you have with your customers, your suppliers, your communities. The internal relationships, those are the ones you have with each other, with your teammates with anyone you interact with inside the company, including your volunteers if you're in fundraising. And then there's the inner relationship. And that's the relationship that you have with yourself and your work. And that's a really important relationship because that's the one that's going to determine how you feel when you get up in the morning and whether or not you start your day with a positive yes attitude. You see, you are the point of origin. How the ask goes starts with you and how you feel, think, and behave around it. So if you're gonna make that big ask this afternoon or tomorrow or next week, before you even think about doing that, you wanna choose a positive, optimistic outlook, like a filter on everything you're about to do. Choose that optimistic, filter and your ask will go much better. That's because optimists outsell pessimistic counterpoints, counterparts by 37%. They are five times less likely to burn out. Five times less likely to burn out. Three times more likely to be engaged in their jobs. They make more money over their career. They live a seven to nine years longer than pessimists. So there are some compelling reasons to learn how to put that optimistic filter on when you work and in your life. What scientists are telling us now, and I study the science of happiness, what scientists are telling us now is that the human body actually works best when it's positive five times more than it's negative. Five to one ratio. Positive emotions make us smarter, healthier, more socially adept, and wealthier. 
and we are more likely to achieve the upper levels of our potential when we are experiencing positive emotion. And that's not only for business, that's in anything we do. Whether we're learning a musical instrument, whether we're singing, whether we are bowling, whether we have a hobby, whether we are parenting, it doesn't matter. You're more likely to achieve your upper levels when you have that positive outlook on whatever you are doing. Here's the rub. According to Rick Hansen, the neuroscience scientist, Dr. Rick Hansen, negative emotions stick like Velcro. And they're supposed to. They're supposed to warn us of danger. Positive emotions, whoop, slide off like Teflon. That's why we need five times more positive emotions than negative emotions, because they don't stick. The good news is the scientists are telling us that we can train our brain to be more positive. You see, neurons that fire together wire together, making strong neural pathways. And so it's easier to get to the positive place. It's easier to get to that positive spot once you've built those neural pathways strong. So now let's go back to this for just a second. Building rapport and building trust right up front is what we want to do first. We want to spend our optimistic time there, building a deep, wide, emotional bank account with our client or our donor. We want to open our ears in a very special way so we can hear where their passion is. We can hear what their problem is if we're in the, if we're in the selling mode. So that's about asking good questions and listening, listening, listening. And then we drop to making the presentation and gaining their commitment and reassure them and finally making the ask. You see, we have a human need for connection. So we're here today in this luncheon seminar and we're all sitting at our own desk with our own sandwiches or salads or whatever. But what would happen if we were all together? What would happen if we were together in, um, in, in a lovely setting and we had this gorgeous buffet in front of us, but none of us knew each other? We'd be lined up for the buffet, and as we were taking our food and putting it in our place, what would, we do, what would we be doing? We'd be talking to each other. And what are we most likely going to talk about? We're going to either talk about the event and what we have in common with the event, why are you here? Or we're going to talk about that gorgeous food. Because as human beings, we have a deep need for connection. I call it the relationship dance. The relationship dance. Did you ever notice when people get together, there seems to be a, a rhythm, a pace, a back and forth, a sort of moving in synchrony. There's a leaning in and a leaning back. And until your prospect feels that they are in a worthwhile dance with you, don't even try for the ask. Until you get in that flow, you won't be successful. So what do we do before the ask? Well, we build that trust and we're gonna keep talking about that, how to build that rapport and that trust. We build that trust by being reliable and dependable, by not over-promising anything. By, by focusing on the common good, by being somewhat predictable in our own behavior, by doing what we say we're going to do, by creating safe emotional space, not a space where we're going to be disagreeing with them or making them wrong or judging them, and by not being focused on that ask too soon. So before the ask, we're going to be building trust. We're going to be building rapport being reliable, being dependable. And how do we do that? Well, for one thing, we don't overpromise and underdeliver. We focus on the common good. We remain somewhat predictable. We do what we say we're gonna do. We create safe emotional space by not disagreeing with people, not making them wrong or, or judging them, by not being focused on the ask too soon, by understanding our clients or our donors' needs. by being a solutions provider, by listening deeply to what matters to them, not what matters to us, but what matters to them, by telling a compelling story of your cause 
and then linking it to their passion. People want to identify with the causes they support. I support PBS because it was a time in my life where I couldn't live without Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers. And I love having non-commercial programming. I support Charity Water because I believe every human being has the right to have a fresh cup of water several times a day. I support Feed America, most likely because I'm Italian. I want to make sure everybody's eating. I support aid for victims of domestic abuse. I support my I support my brother by supporting MS. I support suicide prevention because my life has been so painfully touched by it so many times. When you link your cause to someone else's passion, someone else's purpose, or someone else's pain, you make an emotional connection. You let them know what a difference they can make by supporting your cause as well. And lastly, and we'll be dealing with this in our next seminar, we learn to handle objections kindly, carefully, and skillfully. And all of these activities flow more carefully when we are in rapport with the other. Rapport builds trust. So how do we get into rapport? Well, there's a lot of ways. Rapport actually comes from the French word rapprochement. In English, it means accord, conformity, or harmony. It's a feeling of trust and comfort we have when we're with someone who knows, understands, accepts, and values us. So while it may be very easy, <clears throat> excuse me, to connect with another and build rapport, I mean, some of us do it when we go to Publix. While it's easy to make the connection, <clears throat> excuse me, to build rapport, it's staying in rapport over time that we're looking for when we're building relationships. And trust me, you will never change somebody's mind about something if you are not in rapport with them. When you become skilled at building rapport, and some of you do it beautifully already, when you become skilled at building rapport, the ask gets easier. It's about establishing a relationship with the ability to relate to another and appreciate their view. It's about understanding their model of the world, which may look very different than yours. We tend to forget that we have this huge electronic field around our body. And the largest electromagnetic field we have around our body comes from our heart. I've been studying with the Institute of Heart Math in California for 20 some odd years. I do their practices, I read their, I, I go to their programs, I read their literature. We know scientifically that this electromagnetic field that surrounds our heart is 5,000 times more uh, powerful than the electromagnetic field that surrounds our brain. So where is the energy really coming from? What is people, what are people feeling? They're feeling from our heart. So people can feel us as well as see us. That's kind of known as vibes, right? The vibes that people feel when they're around us. And the vibe of appreciation is one of the most important vibes that we can be putting out. So as you're sitting in your car and you're about to go in and ask, or you're about to go in and sell, put yourself in that delicious place of appreciation. It's very easy to do. Put your hand on your heart. By the way, when you do that, it starts the flow of oxytocin in your body. And oxytocin is known as the tend and befriend chemical. Take a breath. Think about something you deeply appreciate. It doesn't have to be a client, but it could be. The opportunity to go in and tell your story. It could be the fact that you have a job. It could be you want to think about your pet and how you sat in the morning and, and petted your cat. It doesn't matter what you're thinking about as long as it's something that you deeply appreciate. 
And that's going to put your body and your giant magnetic field into that wonderful sine wave of appreciation. So when you walk in to see your client or donor, they're going to get a good vibe to start with. Now, we all have different styles and different strengths. If you've done the DISC uh, profile with us before, and we've, we've done that with national leadership, or if you've done other profiles, you may recognize that we all have different behavioral styles. The D in DISC stands for dominant, which means that someone is a driver. These people ask questions, challenge tradition, and they work very quickly to resolve issues. The I stands for interactive, which also would be called expressive. This is a person that brings a sense of enthusiasm and looks for different approaches. It's not hard to see that I'm an interactive or an expressive. It's the way I operate. I'm pretty easy to read. And then the S stands for steady, also known as amiable. This is the kind of person that excels at calming disagreements. They want things to be pretty even. They easily negotiate conflict between teams and people. And the last one is called compliant. I'm not sure why, because it's really about someone who's analytical and likes to break things down and clarify those complex thoughts. And they're very well organized. We all know people like that. Now these are behavioral styles. Now we all have some portion of those behavioral styles. We all use all four of those styles, but we have a dominant one. And remember, people like people who are like themselves, which is why we have that conversation over the buffet table. So style is an overall approach we use to receive and send messages. Behaviors point to our style, the way we speak, the way we act, the way our desk looks, the way we show up in a room, all point to the style that we are. In my case, my hands have a lot to do with it. People tend to respond negatively to styles that really conflict with their own. And people tend to respond positively and gain trust to those styles that make them feel more comfortable. So I'm gonna ask you to take a look at which one of these styles is more like you. So if you've taken the disc, you already know. But if you haven't taken the disc, that's fine. What disc style do you think you are? We have a little poll. So put down your salad and jump on in. Interesting, I've got some numbers coming in here now. Okay, interesting. The, the, the driver, the dominant people came in, came in after the other one. We have a lot of compliant analytical people. Some expressives, oh, nice, nice. Okay, so those of you who are in the compliant, steady, and interactive uh, aren't, aren't gonna be as driven as those in the dominant ones. We're gonna keep this open for just another, oh, a couple of seconds. Don't have everybody weighing in just yet, but got some, come on. Salad must be good. Sandwich must be yummy. Okay, we have 68% of our people in, and I think I will end the poll. We have 18% people who are identifying themselves as dominants or drivers, 27% as interactives, uh, 27% as steady and 27% pretty evenly paced there. Let me see if I can get this up on the screen for you. There we go. So you can see the results. So the, the smallest group we have is the dominant or the drivers and we're about equally balanced with the people that are interactive, steady and compliant. Lovely, thank you so much. It's important to know your style. Okay, let's close that one. And thank you for that, I appreciate it. Okay, come on, we're clicking. Okay, there is something 
known as the law of requisite variety. I'm trained in NLP, and that's where I learned about the law of requisite variety. The more flexibility you have in your style, the easier it's going to be to build rapport with another. So if you're not married to the way you are, if you're not, oh, this is me and I'm never any different than this. If you're able to be more flexible and more flowing, you'll build rapport with more people. Makes sense, doesn't it? So building rapport is about pacing for alignment. We wanna be in alignment with people because when we're in alignment, people feel good. So we wanna meet the other person where he or she is. We wanna match some part of their ongoing experience. We want to be very empathetic and empathy is a quality of the heart so when you walk in in the heart space when you walk in in that ooh, vibe of appreciation you're actually more able to do this you're actually more able to be empathetic when when you are in that state people are feeling you know i'm like you you can you can trust me and that's what's important i'm like you so you can trust me. That's when it becomes easier to make the ask when you've got that degree of rapport with another. And this is how you will establish both trust and credibility. You may notice that spontaneous pacing is actually natural. Go sit in a coffee shop. Go watch other people. You'll notice in a group, people will mim mimic each other's um, movements. And you'll even notice this in nature. Birds of a feather flock together. I go to the beach a lot. I watch the pelicans. I watch the birds. If you look at a pond, you'll see all the ducks will all of a sudden change and all move in one direction. So pacing is actually a very natural thing. Even though I know, because I've been training salespeople for years, sometimes when we talk to people about pacing, they say, oh, no, that's not natural. Yeah, it actually is. We do it naturally. Because people like people who are like themselves. And when it comes to making the ask, when it comes, look at it this way. It's not just making the ask, it's making the match. You want to be, you want to be the right match with your client, with your donor, with, with your prospect, with your volunteers. Because in some cases you're asking for money. In other cases, you may be asking for someone's time and commitment. All of these things come together. So people who are like people, they like people who are like themselves. And you have to pace before you can lead towards that ask. So you have to make sure you're in that state of rapport before you even go and ask for any money. So now I want you to take a breath. I'm not going to do a poll, but I want you to think about the the, the client, the prospect, the donor that you're gonna see this afternoon, next week. I want you to think about one person. I want you to think about one situation that you're working with right now. And I want you to try to identify whether or not that person is a driver or any one of the styles. So driver, tends to be extroverted. They're very direct. It's kind of easy to remember it that way. They're very, very direct. So when you want to pace a D, you have to be a little careful because they like to be dominant. They're kind of disinterested in how the job is done. They want the overview. So find ways to relate to them, but keep your conversation on task. Keep your presentation brief, concise, and to the point. You can use visuals, but keep them to the point. And you want to let them lead the conversation as much as possible. And if there is a challenge, they want to see if you can stand up to that challenge, but don't make it personal. I had a boss like this. And I can remember the day when I finally realized that the only way I was going to get what I needed was to be a little bit more like him and it worked. When you think your donor or prospect or client is an interactive, an expressive, 
Again, they tend to be more extra, extroverted and very friendly. The, the higher the eye, because people can be a little bit of an eye or a big eye, the higher the eye, the more the need for interaction is there. So you want to show them the very personal benefit of giving. You want to offer them innovative ideas and show respect for their ideas. You want to ask open-ended questions. If you are the type of person that likes to do a little dog and pony show, this is the kind of person you want to do it with because they appreciate it. Again, don't argue. Use testimonials. They, they, they want to know how other people feel and let them lead the conversation. You're beginning to see the relationship dance. Now, when someone is steady, they may be uh, a little bit more introverted. They're very cooperative people, which I like. You can look at that S and you can say security, uh, simplicity. They like security. They like simplicity. They like things that are practical. Um, so collect some personal inf information about them in advance so you kind of know them before you walk in the door. And here's where you can avoid that highly scripted approach. You can be more impromptu, be more informal. Include those visuals and testimonials as well. We want to use empathy and want to invest time in relating to them in letting them know you are like them, they are like you. You want to be more open. You want to be candid. You, you want to connect by using third party references. They want to know who else, like them, has contributed. This is a good place with a person that is a, a steady or an amiable. This is a great place to use your storytelling skills. You know, when you think about it, we are storytelling people. We have been sitting around the fire and telling stories forever. Stories are the way we make sense of the world. So no matter what type of donor or prospect you're dealing with, you really wanna understand your story. You really wanna be able to articulate it in a way that gets them to emote, that gets them to react that positively, that, that, that brings up some emotion with them because whether we're asking for money for a for a cause or whether we're trying to sell someone our product so that we're helping them solve their solution there still needs to be that match if we want that relationship to be long lasting and i think that's the key difference in the way we used to sell and the way we sell now now we look at relationships with the end goal in mind of creating a lifelong, lifetime donor or customer, not just making the sale and getting out of there. So if you think your donor is a C, compliant, I don't think that word says much about this kind of person because I find people in this category are highly intelligent and they're analytical. So when you go in and you're, gonna, you're going to, um, to talk to somebody who's, a, who's the C-type, they, they, have, they have a high need for facts. They have a high need for details. They like to compare things. So first and foremost, you must know your stuff. You must know everything that you can know about your own organization, because trust me, they've checked it out. And you must know as much as you can possibly know about their organization before you go in there because they respect that. So use your logic-based relating with them. Make the structure of, the, of your presentation very clear. Here's what I'm gonna tell you. Here's what we're gonna do today. Make it very clear. Emphasize your analytics. Get your numbers straight. Use some visual aids and leave them with some because they're going to want to study it after you're gone. They want to see how organized you are because remember, like attracts like. So they want to see how organized you are. They want to see your statistics, your charts, your graphs. 
They want to see you balance the pros and cons. What are the benefits of doing it? What are the consequences of doing it? What are the benefits of not doing it? What are the consequences of not doing it? They want to see that you somehow are leading them into the comparisons that are necessary for them to make this decision. Make sure you provide a summary of all the major points and don't offer too many of your personal opinions. This is not a place for personal stories. You can tell the story of your cause, but this is not a place for you to say, oh, last week I was, this is not a place to do that. So are you thinking about that client or donor you're gonna see next week? Are you thinking about what your style is and what their style is? And if you are already compatible, I hope you are because that's what we need to think about before we walk out of the door, because what I'm gonna ask you to do is move into their model of the world, because that's where they operate. Once you move into their model of the world, you can pace them and you can pull them towards what you need them to do, but first you have to be there with them. And this is where I've seen the most resistance sometimes in salespeople, is they, um, they, they invest themselves in their own individuality to the point where they don't want to be fluid. But the law of requisite variety says the more fluid we are, the more options that we have. So move into their model of the world. Now, what if you can't figure out what their behavioral style is? Well, that's okay. That's fine. For years, I resisted any of those categories that put people into boxes. But what I did understand from my studying is that as human beings, we take in information in a certain way, and we take in information from our senses. In business, we take in information primarily through our visual, auditory, and kinesthetic sense. Now, you can, so you can patch, you can, I'm sorry, pace somebody's body language. You know, I move around quite a bit. I notice that when people are with me, they tend to move around a little bit more. I was once in a situation where I was in my office. Uh, this was when I was in the corporate world. I was in my office, sitting at my conference room table with somebody that worked for me. I had a uh, situation where I had hurt my back and I was very, very, very uncomfortable. And I was sitting with a woman by the name of Barbara and I kept moving my shoulder back and I kept, oh, stretching this way and stretching that way. And I had a glass enclosed office. And all of a sudden, we looked outside the window of the office and there was a crowd, a small crowd of people that worked for me forming. So I went to the door and said, what's going on? What are you looking at? And they said, well, we're trying to figure out what's going on in there. It looks like you're having a yoga class. And we burst out laughing because Barbara, who was a natural rapport builder, without even realizing it, was doing every movement that I was doing. That's a natural rapport builder. <laughs> so she was pacing my body language, not consciously, but unconsciously, because this is what we do when we build relationships. I've done a lot of work in call centers teaching customer experience for so many years. I've had the opportunity to be in call centers all over the country. And one of the things that we teach people in call centers is to, is, is to pace people when they're on the phone. Is to, if someone calls up and they're speaking very excitedly and they're moving very fast, well, you wanna match them very quickly so you speed up your speech just a little bit. If someone's moving very slowly, if they're calling you from the south, they will be absolutely offended if you don't spend at least a moment saying, and how are you today? Of course, if somebody calling you in from New York, they want the facts and just the facts right now. So you can see how if, if you've got a person from the South, for instance, talking to a person from New York, they're not going to match until one of them slows down or speeds up to move into the other's model of the world. So people that are visual, they're going to use words like focus and examine and see and view and observe. And I can picture that and illuminate 
and show, show me the money, <laughs> show me the evidence, right? A visual person is going to use those kinds of words. Well, you have the opportunity to paste them by using the same kinds of words. A person that's more auditory, where their primary learning system is auditory through their ears, and lots of people who are in the programming, um, uh, people that are people that are that do a lot of math. A lot of them are very very auditory, and so the auditory words they're, they're going to say, uh, uh, you know, I'll hear from you soon, won't I? They're going to they're going to use words like voice and tell and hear and loud and ask and harmony, and it screams something to them because they their primary system for taking in information is your ears. Now we all use all our systems. But everybody, once again, has that primary system, just like in our behavioral styles. And kinesthetic people want to touch things. They want to, I can handle it. They want to have a grip on things. They, they want to move. They want to impact. They want to they feel. So when you, when you hear those kinds of words, you want to match those kinds of words to a degree, right? We don't want to overdo anything. We want it to feel seamlessly. And, and when you practice this, practice this in a place that's low risk. So practice it with the person behind the counter where you pick up your coffee. Practice it the next time you go out to a restaurant. Practice these kinds of skills. We are not, don't practice them with your number one prospect or client. Practice them where you can have the opportunity to play. This is play. And the more that we can match somebody's style, the more likely they are to like us because the more they feel we are like them. So if someone's using descriptors like very flowery language and they're using lots of adjectives, pull up the adjectives you know, describe things in a richer way because they will feel you are like them. Some people resist this a little bit because they say, oh, but aren't we mimicking? No, we're not mimicking at all. We're matching and we're getting into flow with another. Remember, you don't talk donors into giving gifts. You listen them into giving gifts. You don't talk clients into giving you money. You listen to what their problem is. You listen to where their pain lies. And then you provide them with a solution that's easy for them to implement. So these are all subtle skills that we can learn and we can use to build up to making that ask. Because building rapport, listening clearly, asking good questions are all leading us up to that very simple thing. Making the ask is actually not the hard part. It's everything that leads up to it that makes the ask easier. So at the end of this program, your survey is gonna instantly pop up because feedback is important to us too. So stay with us. The moment I hit the end meeting button, the uh, feedback survey is gonna pop up. And now we have time for questions. And I know that Diana must have some questions. So Diana. That was great. Thank you so much, Joanna. We really always enjoy the content that you provide for us here. So I really want to thank you again. And we do, we have some great questions here. So I'm just going to jump right in and, and start asking because I think the first one is a really good kickstart to review a little bit of what was just said. So um, the first question is, how do you know what, what the type of, of donor you're dealing with is according to that disc profile if you've never met them? Well, that's, um, these days it's easier than ever before. You can look them up on the internet. You can go onto Facebook. You can ask other people who know them. Because the, the, the you know, we used to watch that movie with, uh, what was it called? The Six Degrees of Separation, right? Um, and, and it said that we were only six people away 
from Kevin Bacon. I, it was a crazy movie. I don't know. The, 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 in your age group, Diana, I don't know if you've ever seen it. But with the internet, we are not six degrees away from anybody anymore. We're about three degrees away. So go on LinkedIn and see if you... Now, you can't always find out something about someone, but almost everybody is leaving a trail of information these days. So I would start with LinkedIn. I would start with, then I would go to Google. And I would just, you know, just take a now You don't want people to think you're spying on them, but you want to get a feeling for what's important to them ahead of time. And that's pretty obvious in a lot of people's so social media. It makes sense? I think so. That's great. Great answer. And, and like you said, it's so easy to find. I have, by the way, seen that. So <laughs> for those of you who are in the younger millennial age, it's definitely a good watch and it definitely is helpful. So you're, you're so right. I love that. That's wonderful. Well, I just wanted to quickly take those. You're going to do it yeah. on a date with somebody, right? If once you, you know, you, you meet somebody, you go on a date with them once or twice. What do you do? You come home and you look them up. <laughs> True, that's true. Just so everyone knows too, before I go on to our next question, it's not too late to submit your question. So make sure to jump on the chat box and send a question over. We can definitely still get to one or two more. But in the meantime, I have another great one. Um, so if you're dealing with a husband and wife or you know maybe partners of some sort, um, how do you navigate that couple <laughs> who have different personalities, who have different personalities in general, and you don't know yet who is controlling the checkbook and what's the best way to handle that situation? Oh my gosh. I reported to husband and wife co-CEOs. <laughs> so I can relate with all my heart. Um, you have to get to know both of them. You have to get to know both of them. And when talking to one, you may need to talk to one a little bit differently than you talk to the other one. And I would say give yourself enough time to allow them to reveal to you. So what you're going to be observing. And, you know, I'm a believer that the, the brain works on many different levels. And um, you can instruct your brain to look for different things. So before going into a meeting, you might say to yourself, brain, um, you know, please pay attention to the power dynamic in this couple so that um, I can learn more about what's going on. When you make that conscious to yourself, not to them, but when you make that, con that, that request conscious to yourself, the reticular activating system in your brain is searching for evidence and information. And then when you get out of that face-to-face -face situation, then ask yourself, okay, what is my intuition telling me about who's really got the power here? Because very, very often, the power is not with the one who it appears to be with. And I can tell you that from my experience. And I hope that was helpful. I would say definitely. I know that's certainly hard with the power dynamic, but it's all about relationships, right? And you'll eventually have a relationship with both, I would hope. So great advice. We, we hope Thank so. Thank you. I think in fundraising, there are a lot of those husband and wife teams. Not so much in a selling, but in a selling situation. Now you may be selling... Now, when, let me address the, the, the business to business kind of selling situation. You may be in the room with the, 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 the chief financial officer that has one set of needs, the chief marketing officer who has another set of needs, the chief executive officer, the customer service officer. You may have, you may have four people in the room and they all have different set of needs. So it's your job, you know, take this on, I think that when we ourselves take on the challenge of selling as a game, as a, you know, as, as sort of like a computer game where we have to navigate all the, it, it's a strategic game. So take it on like it's a game. You know, what, what, does, what does this one need? What does this one need? What, what does this? And then structure your presentation so everybody gets a little piece of what they want. A good host, if you think about it, a good host thinks about today, especially today's good host, right? You're putting out a spread. You've got to think about the vegetarians. You've got to think about the meat eaters. You have to think about the vegans. You have to think about the gluten-free people. You have to think about the dairy-free people. <laughs> and what you do ahead of time as you plan that meal is you keep them all in mind. Same thing here. You're planning. Yeah, preparing for everything. Yeah. yeah. There's got to be a little bit for everybody that's involved. <laughs> 
I love that. That's a great way of thinking of it. And you know, that kind of brings us to our next question. So you talked a lot about the heart math, the science. Um, can you talk a little bit more about those vibrations that we send out as we walk into a meeting, Ooh. as we prepare for that meeting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here's my experience with salespeople. Um, it, selling doesn't come natural to a lot of people. And I would guess that a lot of people, especially that are attracted to the fundraising profession, um, aren't natural salespeople. Uh, selling does come natural to some people. I ran a sales division. I used to test people. So I have a, a lot of experience in being able to spot who can sell and who can't sell. Um, so if you're a person that, um, if, if it doesn't come naturally, there's a little bit of fear involved, right? You're afraid you're going to be rejected. You're afraid they won't give you the amount of time you need. You're afraid that your presentation won't go over right. You're afraid that you let your organization down. What happens when we feel fear is that we emit a vibration that's like this. We're jaggedy around the edges. Does that make sense? And, and fear is a very, very powerful vibration. So when we go in and we're feeling fearful, we, emotions are contagious. Let's, let's state that first. Emotions are contagious and fear is a very powerful emotion. So when we go, go in and we're feeling fearful, we can, we can actually cause our prospect to feel a sense of uneasiness. And we don't want to do that. We want them to be completely relaxed in our presence. So by us setting the intention, I intend to put on my most optimistic filter. I intend to emit the most positive vibration I possibly can. And the, and, and the, the emotions that emit those are gratitude and appreciation, joy, love, confidence. There's a whole bunch of positive emotions that emit that, gee, this person's really nice to be around feeling. And that's how you want them to feel. So start to pay attention. Start to pay attention to other people. You know, walk into Starbucks <laughs> like, like Ray Lynn did this morning. See if you can feel the ones. See if you can feel in your body. See if you can feel the ones that are not in a good mood. See if you can feel the ones that are exuding positivity. See if you can relate to those people. I make it a practice, and I think it's a very good practice for all of us. I make it a practice when I'm in a public environment, and I'm talking about things like the supermarket. You know, I like to practice these things in those kinds of places. So I like to make it my business to make sure the checkout clerk at Trader Joe's or at Publix or whatever is feeling good when I leave. I ask myself the questions, when I interact with someone, how do I want them to feel when they leave my presence? And that's a great question to ask. When you interact with someone, how do you want them to feel? So think of when you think about that ahead of time, you're more likely to create it than if you don't think about it at all. I hope that answered the question. Very much so. And thank you so much for going into depth with that, because I think it is really important that we're aware of how we are to others. Yeah. And the more aware, the better we are in those relationships. So that was wonderful. Thank you so much for that. If there are any other questions, you can, of course, reach out to all of us separately, um, and we can answer them privately if we need to. Um, but we thank you again, Joanna, and I'm going to actually turn it over to Ray Lynn so we can get this closed up and move forward. Hi. I wasn't, I, I wasn't ready for that. I was still drinking, drinking my Starbucks from <laughs> earlier, Joanna. <laughs> yeah. so, you know what? I just wanted to say real quickly that disc, disc profile that you talked about that's part of the Sanford Institute, you know, we did an entire workshop on that and it is fascinating. And Joanna, you explained it so well. You don't have to become an FBI profiler to understand, <laughs> people, right? right? You just have to kind of come in and start to observe and listen, which you stated so well and observe, really observe and listen and kind of pick up some traits. So great job handling a really tough discussion. And I'm going to toss it back to Lori to close things up. Sure. Thanks, Raylan. And thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Joanna, really great food for thought. And I just wanted to mention that um, our, we had the, some slight technical difficulties, but everyone who registered and everyone on today's call will receive the full video uh, of this session. So there, 
you'll be able to catch up. You won't have missed anything that was on in the beginning. We look forward to next month's topic, our final session, part four, handling the hard stuff, working with objections. And I, I know that that's going to be a fantastic session and a really important one. So on behalf of TCI of South Florida, have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, all. Bye-bye. And happy holidays next week to who's ever celebrating yeah. whatever holidays they're celebrating. <laughs> <laughs>